Hello, everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. As we sail through the month of December, we're getting one more check-in on Oklahoma's wheat crop with Dr. Amanda Silva, our OSU Extension Small Grain Specialist. And Amanda, since we last talked, I'm happy to report, and I think there's a lot of smiles on a lot of faces because we've seen rain across many parts of the state. Definitely, yeah. So people are really excited uh, about, all, uh, about all this rain. Uh, unfortunately, the panhandle has not seen as much as we would like, but any rain we can get, we'll, we really appreciate it. And yeah, so the, the wheat is small uh, around the state. Um, a lot of uh, fields were planted later. Uh, of course, no forage uh, this year. And, and that's actually what uh, drives one of our studies looking at, at the impact of late planting on, on wheat production. So talk a little bit more about that research that is, has been underway for a little while and you're starting to get some, some takeaways that will inform some of the things you're doing with the extension. Yes, I have a master's student working on that project. So this is the third uh, growing season that we are evaluating different wheat uh, genotypes and different wheat varieties uh, at two seeding rates. So the seeding rate that we are looking at, it's uh, 870,000 and then the uh, 1.4 million seeds per acre. And in this study that we are conducting, we are not seeing a really impact on increasing seeding rate on the late planting. And the late planting that I'm talking about here is December, first week of December. In fact, we just finished planting uh, some other studies that we are also looking at different nitrogen timing and rate. Um, and late planting wheat, we just finished planting last week. And the, the importance of this uh, research that I really wanted to highlight is especially for years like this, where we really need to delay planting uh, for weather conditions. So either a drought, flooding, or sometimes even to manage weeds. So we, we have seen uh, research showing that if you delay planting, wait for that wheat flush to come up and manage that and then plant later, you could, uh, you could really benefit uh, your, your system and reduce the, the chemical application. Could this late planting help producers who want to add in another crop to their systems? Yes, actually, it's one of the of the points of this study. So we have producers interested in having a cotton and wheat production together. So cotton, usually cotton harvest is a little bit late, so which pushes uh, wheat planting to to outside of its optimal window. So it, it definitely can can work in that scenario. But one of the things that we are testing that I, I meant to mention is the, the varieties that we test that we are trying to develop to work in this system. So those varieties, uh, we have one already released by OSU. They need to have a very fast growth early in the season and um, in, uh, in, in the spring, they should also be very quick on coming out of the winter and mature really fast. So they have this, what we say, shorter uh, season. So they, they, they are adapted to, to this uh, scenario, to this late planting scenario. So late planting could be a strategy for producers that are trying to plant uh, cotton, that are trying to go behind uh, corn or plant before uh, soybeans. So it could really help producers to diversify their source of income as well. You talked about the wheat being a little smaller, shorter than we would like it to be this time of year. With some of the temperature swings that we see from pretty cold to mid to high 60s, how is that affecting the plant at this stage? Yes, it's, it's a, it could be a problem, especially for the wheat that are not so well developed. And, but we have seen the wheat also do really well in those, in those situations. So it's something that we'll be watching. Uh, we wish uh, that the wheat was well more developed to face those single digits uh, temperature, but just wait and see, right? Yeah. <laughs> and hope for the best. Yes. Well, Amanda, thank you very much. Uh, great information and we'll see you again early next year. Thanks a lot. Welcome to the Mesonet Weather Report. I'm Wes Lee. Cooler air is on the way. 
This forecast map is for the Christmas week and shows significant dark blue or likely cooler than normal areas over much of the U.S. The Mesonet Cattle Comfort Index is a tool developed to help livestock producers to better manage animals in extreme hot or cold environments. You can look at historical or current conditions and a two-day forecast of the expected index. This map from Tuesday shows that on that day it was either in the comfortable or slight caution range. This index utilizes temperature, wind speed, humidity, and sunlight to come up with a number that symbolizes how cattle might feel. Available tables show that in winter temperatures are adjusted higher due to high humidity and winds but lowered with strong sunlight. Cattle exposed to a colder index will require some extra attention to help them cope with the added stress. A rule of thumb for feeding cows in cold weather is to increase feed by 1% each degree the cattle comfort index is below 32 with a dry hair coat. Limit increases to no more than 25% to avoid digestion issues. For extremely cold temperatures, it may require an increased feed level before and after it occurs. Now here's Gary focusing on the drought and moisture situation. Thanks, Wes, and good morning, everyone. Well, we had yet another storm system move through the state, giving most of us at least a decent dose of rain. How did that impact the drought monitor? Let's take a look. Well, once again, we've seen improvements in localized areas and large-scale improvement over across parts of central down into south-central Oklahoma, and also a little bit more into east-central Oklahoma. We do still have a large area of the state in an extreme to exceptional drought, those red colors, which indicate the worst two categories on the drought monitor. But all in all, we are improving as we go through the cool season, which was a little bit unexpected, but certainly welcome. We can take a look at the rainfall data from the last 30 days from Oklahoma Mesonet. We see much of the state as we go from northwest to southeast, uh, two to three to four inches, and then down in uh, far southeastern Oklahoma, over into east central Oklahoma, we get up into the uh, seven inch rain. So a good amount of rain over most of the state, but as we see up in the northwest corner in the panhandle, those areas continue to miss out and much more is needed in those areas. Easy to see the lucky areas on the departure from normal rainfall map from the last 30 days. Uh, again, those surplus amounts in the green show from about an inch above normal to uh, two to three inches above normal as we get over into eastern Oklahoma. Uh, out in the panhandle, again, in the far northwest, uh, close to normal, but mostly below normal by about a half inch or so. So those are the areas that continue to miss out. And it is the cool season, so how do those surpluses and deficits uh, amount to what we would normally expect for this time of year, at least over the last 30 days? Well, for much of us, it's 150 to as much as 200% above normal, and that's that's really good news for drought relief, but again in the panhandle, uh, less than 50% of normal for the most part. The latest drought outlook just released from the Climate Prediction Center does show drought expected to persist across the state where it currently exists at least through the end of March. So that wouldn't be good news if it comes true, but let's hope for better news as we actually go forward. So we've gotten a good start in parts of the state, southeast Oklahoma, getting rid of that drought. We simply need more precipitation as we travel to the northwest. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Time to check in to see what's happening in the grain markets with our crop marketing specialist, Dr. Kim Anderson. So Kim, is there any news happening this week? There's a lot going on this week. I, I think the number one thing and that uh, we're paying attention to is we got some moisture. Now the moisture's not evenly distributed around, but it, I think we can get some excitement with that. Uh, we've got the uh, Fed with their interest rates. The dollar declined this week. I think that's good news for our exports and our exports have been a little weak over the, over the last month or so. We need those exports to pick up. It looks like our wheat prices bottomed out. You know, we took about, what, a dollar and a quarter off of them. I went down below $8. They're back above eight now. I think, I think that's good news. And then you've got things going on in South America, Argentina, Australia, finishing up there. 
their crops. Just a lot going on right now. And it's, it, you wouldn't expect this in this between Thanksgiving and Christmas time period. So, you know, for the past couple of weeks, we've always obviously been talking about Russia's war with Ukraine. Is there any news coming out of there? Well, I think there's kind of a lull there. The fighting's still going on. But Russia, the reports are that Russia's waiting for the ground to freeze and then they're going to have a big offensive and, and the war is expected to escalate. And I think the market's going to be nervous until we see what goes on when we get into the winter and when we have the winter war going on between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, this week, uh, you look at uh, Russia's ha put some uh, rockets in uh, Odessa, uh, uh, destroyed and upset the electrical grids. They had to stop the, it impacted the export elevators. But now they still shipped uh, eight, uh, put out uh, eight ships this week. Uh, the other thing that's going on is kind of on the sideline. Russia says we're going to let it, let them ship, but then they, they restrict the inspections as it gets into, into Turkey and Istanbul there. Quite a bit going on. So, you know, taking a bird's eye view, just looking at the world markets in general, you know, what's what's kind of shaking out there? Are there any, any more news coming out? Well, you've got in Argentina and Australia, I mentioned there, the dry weathers. Also, uh, their, their exports, their production's come in a little less than expected. Uh, they're not getting the next crop put in like, like they wanted. There's some political problems down in that part of the world. I think that's helping support our prices a little bit. And of course, there, you haven't seen any news come out of Australia, but you know they were having trouble with their harvest, and their harvest is coming to an end here in the next couple of weeks. We'll have a final number on Argentina and Australia as we approach Christmas and the first of the year. You know, you mentioned moisture. You know, the majority of the state, you know, except for the Panhandle, feel sorry for those for those folks out there. But we did get you know some some rain this week. So if we keep keep getting rain, what's that going to mean for prices for uh, 2023 wheat? Well, I don't think it's going to have much on prices, and we can get overly optimistic with this rain. We're still in a drought situation over most of uh, Oklahoma, and I don't think we've got enough rain to get runoff. We need some water in our ponds. We need we need to get some subsoil moisture. We got topsoil, and the uh, producers report to me that these rains will probably get them into that February March time period when they're going to need more rain, but to to solve this drought situation and to get us to harvest, we're gonna to have to have a lot more rain than we got this week. More mud. More mud. All right, thanks, Kim. Dr. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Good morning, Oklahoma, and welcome to Cow Calf Corner. This week's topic is forage budgeting, specifically with non-traditional hay sources. As we've talked over the last few months, we know we've gotten into situations this year because of drought and excessive heat, that in a lot of cases we may be feeding some types of hay, be it cotton, corn, milo, some different type of sorghum that we haven't traditionally fed. We know that a feed analysis test is critical to tell us that crude protein content, the energy content, in the form of TDN. And if we look at this as we typically would, we'll take, for example, some information out of chapter 16 of the OSU Beef Manual. If we've got a 1,300 pound dry cow last trimester of pregnancy, if we're feeding her some type of hay that tests about 54.5% TDN, 7.5% crude protein, we assume she's going to consume about 1.9% of her body weight per day in dry matter. She's going to eat enough of that hay to meet her energy and protein requirements without any additional supplementation. So that's about 24 half and a, 24 and a half pounds a day of dry matter intake from that particular source of hay. But we can't stop there as we get into forage budgeting. We realize that every bale of hay we feed probably somewhere around 7 to 10% moisture or 90 to 93% dry matter. So we're going to take that into account and add two or three more pounds of actual hay that we have to feed to that cow as well. We also know that when we feed hay, all of it doesn't get consumed. In a typical year, we expect 6 to 20% waste hay that's going to be pulled out, laid on, to some extent it's going to get wasted. We know that we can improve that if we're feeding in round bale hay feeders 
by using sheeted bottom feeders that are going to contribute to less waste than an open bottom hay feeder. And probably best case scenario, uh, enclosed bottom with a cone shape or what many refer to as a hay saver, we're going to be able to reduce that hay waste even more. But typically, depending on what form we're putting that hay out in and potentially even just unrolling enough hay each day to meet those cows intake needs, we're looking at 6 to 20 percent. Some of the unique things we get into this year on these non-traditional hay sources, something like corn stalk hay, just in the past few weeks I've heard from several producers that are estimating that a third to 40 percent of each bale is in the form of those lower stalks that cows just simply will not eat. They're going to sort that out. It's going to accumulate around hay feeders or accumulate in the spots in our pasture where we roll out hay. That is another form of waste we're going to have to take into account as we start thinking about that. So as we come up with some realistic estimate of how much hay gets wasted, we've got to tack that on to the actual amount of hay that we feed each day as well. So this same 1,300 pound cow, 24 and a half pounds of dry matter intake, two or three more pounds added as a result of dry matter. We're looking at adding another seven to eight pounds of hay on as is to account for wastage, possibly even more. And now we're starting to look at 36, 37 pounds of actual hay fed per day. Another final thing we need to take into account. How much of the bale of hay has actually been spoiled? If we think of a typical big round bale that's about five and a half foot tall, there's actually about half the weight of that bale in the outer six inches. If we're looking at a bale of hay that's been stored on the ground and we've only got two to three inches of spoilage on the bottom, we need some kind of a realistic estimate of how much that is accounting the total weight of that bale. One thing that is a positive this year since we've probably been buying a lot of hay and having it trucked in, if we're buying it by the tonnage, it's easy to divide the actual tonnage relative to the amount of bales on the semi-load to know what each bale of hay weighed whenever we took delivery. By taking into account the amount of spoilage, some of those estimates of how much of that weight is in the outer part of that bale, it helps us do a better job of budgeting how much hay to actually put out each day. I hope this helps, and again, I know hay is scarce and extremely valuable this year. We need to feed enough, but we don't want to be rolling out or feeding any more of it than we actually have to. Thanks for joining us on Cow-Calf Corner. Talking insects and what to plan for now to make things a little easier come springtime. Once again, here's Curtis Hare and our OSU Extension entomologist, Dr. Tom Royer. Well, we keep getting rain and the wheat continues to grow. So Tom, it's been a couple months since we've spoken with you. And, and back then, you know, the, there wasn't a lot going on in regards to insect pressure because, well, you know, we didn't really have any wheat up. Exactly. But now that we do, how, are you hearing anything? I haven't heard a lot about what's going on in wheat because it's come up so late. So that kind of delays some of the insects that we would normally expect to see this fall. But I got an interesting call the other day from uh, some farmers up in Kay County that were seeing uh, winter grain mites and they took some videos of it and they were like thousands of them crawling around and wanted to know what to do about it so that's that's a challenge because we don't have a lot of uh, we don't have we don't have to treat for them too often and we don't have a lot of insecticide uh, products that are registered to control them so um, I'm maybe hoping to get up there and put out a, a quick test to see what products would work but other than that, it's been really quiet. You know, that might not be a problem, but you know, if it does continue to be an issue, how do, how do producers scout for grain mites? That, that's, that's the other challenge is because, because on a bright sunny day like this, they want to be as far down in the, even under the soil, but at the crown level, they hate the sunlight. They come out at night or they come out on a cloudy day. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's hard to scout for them. We don't really have any thresholds that we can give anybody. Basically, our thresholds is if you see a lot of mites and it's showing evidence of damage, 
it's time to control them. So, you know, in regards to just drought in general, how does drought impact, you know, insect pressure going forward, even though if we do get some rain, but if it, you know, if the drought, you know, extended out, but the weed is able to come up, how, what's the insect pressure usually well, like? Well, the, the drought has an impact on the wheat because, you know, if, if it's dry, the wheat is stressed. And uh, a lot of times, like an, an insect like green bug can even cause worse problems for the wheat when it's under drought stress or even bird cherry and things like that, uh, just because they're already under stress and then they have that additional stress from an insect. But, uh, and, and, and then last spring, when, uh, when the, the wheat was under drought stress, um, that's when we saw an outbreak of another mite called the brown wheat mite that was really causing some issues last spring. So uh, drought causes all kinds of issues that we don't typically see all the time. So in regards to like continuing to scout, so what are some, what are some ways of like scouting methods that producers can take? Well. It, it's it's not uh, it's not sim uh, it's pretty simple. You just have to get out and and be looking, see if there's evidence of insects. We do have a, a smartphone application for green bugs that we can use. It's called Glance and Go. I've talked about it before, I know, but it it works pretty well for green bugs. Uh, but for some of the other insects, you just have to be out. If you start noticing that maybe the stand is suffering. Uh, you're seeing some evidence of feeding activity from army cutworms or something like that. Just need to be out there uh, looking ahead of time so that you can take care of the problem before it becomes a serious problem. And you know, you know, finally, you actually have some big news and sad news for us at Sunup, but you're retiring. I am. I um, I figured 26 years. I I've enjoyed working at Oklahoma State. I love I love living in Oklahoma. I'm going to continue to live here. Um, I love living here and I have loved working for Oklahoma State for the last 26 years. It's been, it's been a pleasure for me, um, raised my kids here and everything. So I'm um, just gonna uh, retire, I wanna see my grandkids and uh, just do some other things now. And it's, it's gonna be sad for me too, but I think it's just time. Well, for everybody here at SUNUP and all of Extension, we just wanna thank you for your years of service. Well, thank you, I really appreciate it. And I've enjoyed working with SUNUP for a long time, ever since I got here. So it's, it's gone through some evolutions over the years, but uh, it's been, I think it's been a good service for the producers of Oklahoma. All right, thanks. Finally, Tom Royer, Extension Entomologist here at Oklahoma State University. Thanks guys, and congratulations, Tom. We will miss you. Finally today, we meet a woman who's dedicated to making her community a better place. That's why Patsy Ann Nick Smith is a distinguished alumna in the Ferguson College of Agriculture. Patsy Ann Nick Smith is the best known anonymous person in Tahlequah. 60% of the people in Tahlequah think her name is anonymous because she does so much, not only for Cherokee County, Tahlequah, OSU, the state of Oklahoma. If people need things, they know where to go get it. Patsy is always willing to step up, do above and beyond her part. And I couldn't think of a better person to receive this award than her. Patsy Ann was born in Oklahoma City but spent summers and as much time as possible in Tahlequah, starting at the age of three. When my father was in World War II, my mother got an opportunity to go be with him because so many of World War II vet people were not coming back, Army soldiers. So she got to go out and be with him for six or eight weeks. So she shipped me over here to two old maid aunts and uh, shipped my brother off up to our grandfather's because he had boys and knew how to deal with boys. Her aunt also bought the three-year-old a Shetland pony to help keep her out of trouble. To get me on horseback was probably the best thing she ever did for me because, you know, kept me out of the bars, kept me going straight. Horses are good for you. Horses are not my whole life, but they make my life whole. She decided to go to OSU, and while she wanted to go into animal science, there was a problem. I wanted to be in animal science. I wasn't any good in animal science, so it was easier to do that, to go into general agriculture. My mother said, get your education, because they're always going to need teachers. 
Daddy said, get your business because there's always going to be businesses. Patsy Ann joined Brock and Bridal, spending much of her time hanging out at the OSU Animal Barns. I dated a barn boy, so I ferreted a lot of pigs. Uh, that was better than a date as far as I was concerned. After graduation, Patsy Ann returned to the family business in manufacturing and industrial supply. When her parents sold the company, they started the Nix Foundation, which she eventually inherited. She and her nephew, Jimmy Nix, are now directors of the Nix Foundation. They have created OSU scholarships and supported animal science facilities across campus. Because I have heard other land-grant colleges have given up their, their places, I just think that we need to keep the barns. That's agriculture. If you get her into a discussion about OSU versus other institutions, uh, she, she's pretty strong-willed about that. She's pretty strong-willed about everything. Uh, one of the things I really like about her, though, is that she really wants to see uh, us continue to have success with the varied animal units that we have on campus. I have a sign out here. It's work for the cause, not the applause. And OSU just had a lot of cause. She values education. She values agriculture. She's a hard worker, and she believes in the people who work hard. She supports those people. And so whenever I heard that she was getting this award, I thought, wow, Patsy is the person. Now you're getting the true Patsy. Patsy Ann wants to be very clear on why she donates and how she wants to be remembered. As a friendly cuss, a little straightforward. I just, the only strangers in my life are those people I haven't met and I try to do it for the cause, not the applause. Celebrating Patsy Ann Nick Smith, 2022 Ferguson College of Agriculture Distinguished Alumni. That'll do it for us this week. A reminder, you can see us anytime on our website and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and remember Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.